So they're like, yeah, get as low as you can to the ground, flex the, uh, the, tr- the torso forward as far as you can, and then just unravel everything as fast as possible and, and launch into the air. The problem we get into with collapsing of torso and all these different um, hyperflex positions is eye line changes, right? Position of the torso on takeoff, right? If we're collapsed forward, we then have to recover the torso before we can lift. And that time spent recovering the torso is time spent on the Mm -hmm. ground, which is a longer ground reaction time, as well as a loss of potential energy. The Full Depth Podcast is brought to you by VersaLifts. Depth matters. Visit vlifts.com and enter promo code FULLDEPTH for 10% off your next order. We're good. We're so good right now. What's going on, guys? It's Tyler Ray here, the host of the Full Depth Podcast, joined with, as always, by Handsome Mike on the mic. And we are back here again in our festive background mm-hmm. at Sweat Fitness and Performance with another episode. Here we go. We're back on track <laughs> once a week. Once a week, back on track. So last week's episode, we touched a little bit on uh, supplementation and uh, some supplements that are appropriate for the world of functional fitness. And thank you guys for your feedback so far. We really appreciate that. We are back today to talk about a new subject, one that is near and dear to my heart, um, jump training and the potential applications to CrossFit in the world of, I guess, just functional fitness. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, in my opinion, this is the one area of uh, training for CrossFit that uh, could use some extra focus and being a jump specialist and, you know, a proponent of the vertical jump world. I think this is something that I can shed quite a bit of light on. This will be a really cool cast because it's not your typical jump train like everybody at home knows. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit different. It's not the same as as what people expect it to be. Um, I'm not going to – I'm just going to give a little (laughs) tease out there, but – it's 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 shed some light on on my opinion of jump training yeah. and what I thought jump training was from a um, athlete perspective to now seeing what Tyler does it's totally different than than what I was used to doing so yeah. it's it's super cool a little bit different but effective nonetheless so yep. um, I've mentioned prior that I have a background obviously in athletics as a track and field athlete for multiple years and then as a professional dunker mm-hmm. for another handful of multiple years as well so jumping really became a big part of my life from an early age and I wrote a really cool little article on on kind of how I got immersed into the jump slash dunk world from um, that kind of even five, six, seven years old. Um, I can remember having this like urge and passion to always go out into the backyard where we had the basketball net and uh, um, that's okay, Hollywood here. Uh, (laughs) Uh, It's okay to go out to the backyard and, um, you know, put the net down to six, seven feet when you're yeah. a tiny little kid and try to dunk. Um, similar height to what you would practice on now, Mike, is that yeah. kind of like yeah, yeah, four yeah. To, hey. to six feet range. Uh, but yeah, so, you know, jumping was one thing that I just, I didn't realize at the time how monumental of a uh, part of my life that was mm-hmm. until I now can reflect and look back at my life a little bit. It'd be cool to see if you can extrapolate all those that are dunking, those that are jumping high, mm-hmm. if if we could take a look um, in their in their past and as a childhood, if yeah. like were they all jumping at an early age? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's it'd a be facet. cool to see like if if that correlates into them jumping in an, in, a, in a later right. stage of their life. Yeah, I think there's I like mean, an inherent love for movement when you're a kid, right? And I think as a a child that has that predisposition to be athletic as well, mm-hmm. you kind of find the um, kind of that stream of movement that you enjoy the most, right? Some people just like to run and, and run for a long time and sprint, and I just fell into the world I'm of jumping. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, because when I was a kid, mm-hmm. I was eating pasta and pizza and bread, and I can't jump high, so I'm not sure if that correlates. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right, though. Like, you, you know, you got to have that carb load. Right? Maybe you were, your future was <laughs> in, the, in the world of um, long-distance athletics and marathon running. Maybe you're carving up from an early age. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Oh. I don't know. So yeah, like I, you know, progressed obviously through school and I remember, you know, even now I get messages from like old um, elementary school Mm -hmm. and high Mm -hmm. school kids that went to school with me and they're like, man, it's so cool to see you doing the thing that you did when you were a kid that we were all like, oh, there goes Tyler again, he's showing off. And then, you know, it never really changed. I just (laughs) became older and it became a little bit more applicable to other athletes as I transitioned into the world of coaching. So, um, I run an Instagram channel at Project Pure Athlete, and we'll put it up here. You guys can check it out. And, you know, what I try to do that's a little bit different from typical jump training channels is um, I break down vertical jumps, so more technical elements and mechanical elements of of a vertical jump. Mm -hmm. And they range, right? So, you know, single leg, double leg, uh, full approach, standing, you know, standing jumps, um, different types of sports, because, again, the needs of a jump are going to vary sport to sport. And that's where, you know, getting into the world of CrossFit and the need for um, what comprises a vertical jump becomes a bit different than right. per se for, you know, um, volleyball and uh, basketball, things like that. Mm-hmm. So I want to touch on 
a little bit about you know my take on vertical jump trading that might be a little bit different from what you guys are used to seeing. And if you've never seen anything on vertical jumping to begin with, then you know sit down, strap in, and uh, grab a notepad. Grab a notepad. Notes, maybe yeah. take some notes. I think this is uh, some of the stuff can be very helpful for you moving forward. So, yep. a little bit about uh, jump training 101. And we do this with all our athletes. I, d I work and Mike work with a lot of volleyball players. Mm -hmm. Sky Volleyball Club, what's up? I just like mumbled that. I was like, Sky Ball, blah, 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 <laughs> blah, 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 blah. That's okay, though. You know what I'm saying. The V and the B insert, is so hard to Insert do. logo here. I'll do it. You won't. So a little bit about Jump Training 101. So we, in order to execute a jump, we need a combination of um, four concrete factors. So we have speed. Mm -hmm. We have power. And I think that's where a lot of people's focus finishes. Sure. It stops there. Mm -hmm. It's like, we just get faster and, and stronger and now we jump higher. And to a degree, mm -hmm. yes. But introduce stability right. and position. Mm -hmm. And that's where you, um, that's where efficiency becomes the key. Well, that's so, so, so one part of my training where, um, like where I studied jump training and, and like we always talked about the, you know, if you get an athlete strong, he, he has a potential to jump higher. If he, um, if you get him more explosive, he's got the potential to jump higher and, or sprint faster, whatever, whatever yes. the case may be. I never, I always overlook the stability component to a jump and also positioning of a jump, yep. you know, and, and, and <laughs> when I start jumping, it's like, I'm going like forward as opposed to high. Exactly. Um, and that's just cause like my, my whole position's off and, and potentially even my stability component when it comes to the takeoff isn't necessarily there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, which makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And that's the most overlooked part. So I get a lot of messages on a daily basis through Instagram, Facebook, email, and it's always one of a few things, but mm -hmm. the most common question is what is the best exercise for increasing your vertical jump? And because I've had that question so many times, it's kind of lost meaning and, I, and it's white noise now. However, you know, my, my common um, answer to that is jumping. Mm -hmm. You know, what's going to be the best thing to help your jump is jump more, uh, jump often and, uh, you know, perfect practice, right? So that's where, you know, insert me and uh, what I bring to the table. So what I do that's a little bit different is we focus a lot on the stability element. So there's a heavy stability bias in the training that I do with athletes, no matter uh, what sport they're in. Because introducing all the speed and all the power in the world is great, but if we don't have the requisite stability to be able to support the power and the speed, then you, you might as well have not gotten that because we're not able to express that mm -hmm. um, through a translation in a vertical jump. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which makes total sense because like from a strength conditioning perspective, like if I'm going to have somebody squat, I'm not going to put you know, 300 pounds on their back if they don't have the requisite stability to support that. So why wouldn't it be the same with jump training? It's exactly. the exact same. I think people just assume that because it's just body weight and you're just jumping, mm -hmm. it's not that intense on the body, yet it's probably the most intense thing you can do on your body because it's the most explosive, yeah. maximal can, effort thing yeah. you'll ever do. And I can speak from much, much experience mm -hmm. that it is quite hard on the body, especially the um, higher you're able to jump. It mm -hmm. doesn't become the jump that's hard on your body. It becomes the landing mm -hmm. elements of jumping. And, uh, you know, in the peak of my, my jump career, you know, I was practicing two or three times a week and accumulating anywhere from 75 to 150 full attempts in a session. Mm -hmm. So you imagine the wear and tear that has on landing. I mean, Trev behind the camera has seen it firsthand with some photography that, you know, it's, it's intensive and it's a workout and, um, the toll in the body becomes hard. So we, we put a heavy bias in on the stability required to support the volume and the longevity of an athlete's mm -hmm. uh, career. Mm -hmm. Um, Couple term, a couple pieces of terminology there uh, that we're going to go over. Uh, one first is uh, MCV or maximum control velocity. Sure. So I'm going to speak a little bit to the the um, broad base of vertical jump training before we get into the application into CrossFit. So we talk a little bit about MCV or maximum control velocity. So this is the concept that I discussed a little bit about having the speed, having the power, but then not necessarily being able to support that with the stability required to right. translate that, right? So what we do is we determine an athlete's MCV by having them jump. So we find out where's the limit, you know, where's the limit at which we're carrying speed and no longer able to translate that into an effective takeoff angle mm -hmm. to appropriate maximum height. And then we work within that realm and find out how much work we need to do in what areas of stability. Sure. Cause there's multiple areas of stability to focus on when it comes to jump training. I mean, we have trunk stability, both linear and rotational, mm -hmm. We have uh, joint integrity, so we have stability at the joints, mm -hmm. not just static, but also dynamic stability. So mm -hmm. that's the that's the one place, and we'll get into this later, that I think um, the CrossFit world is lacking yeah. when it comes to jumping and expressing that movement is the element of dynamic stability mm -hmm. because of the change in uh, workout, right, yep. and intensity and um, 
uh, longevity. And there's so much the jumping happening in a CrossFit. Uh, it not even have to be traditional, right? No, it could be, yeah. Like even like box jump burpee, right? Like yeah. that is its own kind of its variation of the jump. Yeah, absolutely. So we go maximum control velocity. We then take a look at an athlete's ground reaction forces and more importantly, the ground reaction time. So how long an athlete spends in that amortization phase or mm -hmm. when they're translating the speed into lift, how much time they spend on the ground. Because ideally, the, the faster we can approach a jump, mm -hmm with the maximum amount of power output, with the maximum amount of stability, we have a smaller ground reaction time. So does your ground reaction time depend on the stability of? Large, of largely, yeah. So there's, I mean, there's a lot of factors that go into it, but to keep it kind of um, surface level right now, sure. a little bit more superficial, um, yeah, stability plays a huge role in that, right? Because if we're carrying that speed, we need to then put a violent stop to the speed in order to translate that. And if we Otherwise, don't no stability, it's, it dampens the energy that's released. Exactly. It, it goes into the floor as opposed to up. And exactly. And then we, what we see there is an athlete that has a great amount of speed, but doesn't have the stability. Mm -hmm. So we might have a really fast ground reaction time, but then we have a, an affected takeoff sure. angle. So an athlete will then quote unquote blow through a takeoff and end up on a more horizontal tra trajectory than a vertical trajectory. And that's the things I'm looking out for. So when I get a, I get an athlete's jump sent to me, um, typically in slow motion from a side angle. And we take a look at it from a couple different angles. Uh, we take a look at one is maximum control velocity. So is the athlete, um, utilizing their speed and stability mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. We then take a look at how much time they're spending on the ground and why. Why is that affected? Are they slow off the ground because of an issue with um, power or is it stability? And then we have to kind of unravel from there and work backward a little bit. Uh, last point we're going to talk about is joint stacking. And mm -hmm. this one is, again, this conceptually plays a lot of role in the CrossFit world. So when we stack a joint or um, line up a sequence of joints in a row when they're, you know, quote unquote, locked out, mm -hmm. we then have a more stable structure, Sure. right? So when it comes to a jump, what we want to look for when an athlete takes off is that their ankles, their hips, and their shoulders are fairly stacked. They're not going to be 100% right. straight because that's very difficult with the angles created at the body. But what, what we look for is those joints kind of mm -hmm. put in a position that is a much more stable environment on takeoff. There's, again, a lot of factors that go into an athlete reaching that joint stacking. Right. And, um, and again, that's something else that I would take a look at. And you're always looking at, um, like, so like what you look for is um, kind of almost like a vertical stacking as opposed mm -hmm. to like a, a um, horizontal or, or yeah. a flex position, right? Is that yeah. what you're, you're getting at? Absolutely. I think that's the most common misconception with um, uh, jumping. And I see it especially in the, in the female world of jumping when it comes to like volleyball, basketball, mm -hmm. things like that, is we see this very, and it's of no fault other than maybe just lack of application, mm -hmm. but females are told largely in volleyball that the, the more you can collapse the torso forward, the more unraveling of a torso and creating that hip extension and, and upward force, right? Because, tr you know, typically the a female is um, a lot less naturally powerful than a male is. So they're like, yeah, get as low as you can to the ground, flex the, uh, the, tr the torso forward as far as you can, and then just unravel everything as fast as possible and, and launch into the air. The problem we get into with collapsing of torso and all these different um, hyperflex positions is eye line changes, right? Position of the torso on takeoff, right? If we're collapsed forward, we then have to recover the torso before we can lift. And that time spent recovering the torso is time spent on the mm -hmm. ground, which is a longer ground reaction right. time, as well as a loss of potential energy. So the reason I, you know, I coach and, and train people to approach and plant in a more vertical torso, leading with the legs and the hips versus leading with the head and the shoulders is to mitigate some of those effects of a longer ground reaction mm -hmm. time. Drop the mic and mic drop. Uh, so that's the concept of joint stacking. Cool. Okay, so now we get into, here we have jump training and, and how I approach jump training, and now we have CrossFit. And I love CrossFit, and I, and I do CrossFit. And I think some of the fundamental applications of the jump training I've done have helped me in areas of, of CrossFit where, at, where if I had approached this without that background, I would have had a lot longer to be able to, um, you know, merge into some of the high-end output that I've yeah. been doing. Um, I have a, a very strong hip extension as mm -hmm. a result of jumping. So without even really ever training to do things like power cleaning and cleaning, um, you know, it comes more, na it comes more naturally. Exactly. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of power generated through there and, and I, you know, box jumping a, a much more efficient box right. jumper than a lot of people. So mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily play as heavily on the body and we'll get into that a bit. So 
I see vertical jump training and CrossFit as something that needs to be practiced as a skill. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you've seen it before box jumping and, and now it's not just box jumping. I'm, I'm just using that as kind of the, of an example, mm -hmm. but box jumping is something that in CrossFit we only ever see under fatigue, right? And at a, a lot of reps, it's meant, yeah, it's meant more of a, of a conditioning kind of Metcon tool versus a skill. Right. And we, what we'll do is we'll see an athlete that really never reaches a, an extended hip position because there's no, there's no real need for it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that if practiced as a skill, that athlete can't attain a more um, open hip extension and as a, as, it, or, uh, as a result improve their efficiency of, of their jump. Mm -hmm. And I think by improving the efficiency and the mechanics behind a movement, I think this is just plain science, is that efficiency is going to um, make sure that the, the wear on the actual body over a course of a workout is lower. Yeah. Right? So then the fatigue levels are going to be lowered as a result of that. How many of the CrossFit athletes are actually doing any type of uh, jump training? I mean, I'd be speculating at this point. I, I recently saw Marcus Philly mm -hmm. post um, a little bit of, of some single leg um, bounding box jumps, some stability work, which when I saw, I was like, awesome. So yeah. I threw um, Marcus a text and he was like, yeah, he's like, you know, your stuff looks awesome and blah, blah, blah. And I think you know, athletes like this that are kind of pioneering a little bit more of it. Why not? Like CrossFit's dabbled into every other world. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like we have Chris Hinshaw as an aerobic capacity specialist. He was mm -hmm. a, a runner, an, an Ironman, a triathlete. Mm -hmm. Like he was a long distance runner that was good and understands the, the mechanics of running and how to improve someone's aerobic capacity. Right. You know, I understand very well how to improve someone's ability to express power through violent hip extension, mm -hmm. whether that's applied uh, in the in the confines of box jumping or Olympic lifting or um, landing mechanics to to an reduce risk of injury and mm -hmm. things like landing off of, of muscle ups and the rings and coming down um, off the box in in precarious well, positions. Just think, well, just think how like, so if if you're performing so if somebody is very inefficient at jumping, mm -hmm. they're they're producing a lot of fatigue during the jumping portion of the the, yeah. the 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 workouts which they could probably spend that time recovering or not putting that much energy into it so exactly i, I think i mean especially in the um, in the obstacle course at the crossfit event uh, games yeah like those the top end right the the crossfit games level yeah. we run into scenarios in which things have become very unknowable and aren't traditional crossfit box workouts mm -hmm. right obstacle course, Madison triplet, mm -hmm. um, you know, sled, the sledgehammer, um, the assault banger workout. Right. We have all these ones that are, yes, they, they utilize all the fundamental elements of fitness and, uh, and movement. However, it's like the one thing that I don't see in any training regimen is, is this kind of um, bias toward dynamic stability and mm -hmm. express, expressing that jumping pattern. Mm -hmm. And now it's not just a, as simple as saying, okay, I'll just sit there and practice box jumping over and over and over again, right? It's not as simple as that. Same reason when you weight lift, you don't just sit there and, and, and weight lift. You segment things, you break things right. down into their components, and then you drill those, drill those until right. they become very efficient, right? I, so I, I find there's no need to necessarily separate jumping um, away from alternative modalities of training and, you know, just say, oh, we, we do jumping, it's box jumping, it's part of, it's part of a workout. It's, it's a skill. Mm -hmm. Jumping is a, is a skill in its own. Um, that's, there's a reason why, you know, in high-level athletics, we have jumping-based movements. When you look at track and field, track and field is athletics, right? Mm -hmm. It was coined athletics from the get-go. It's run, jump, throw, mm -hmm. right? So we have running in CrossFit. We have, uh, you know, not so much throwing elements, but then we have jumping, right? So let's yeah make that a little bit more efficient. I must say that... Um over the last couple of months that you've been working with your volleyball players here, um, and, and there's one one kid in particular, Matt, mm -hmm. who you've probably done maybe a handful of jumping, uh, like, like actual jumping workouts with him, and, and you spent more time on stability, um, especially like sticking the landing and making sure that his, his ankles are, are, are stable enough, especially after his injury that he that, that, that he had. Yep. Um, and then like he increased his PR by what, five or seven inches or whatever? Seven, seven. since we started working. Right, and, and you did maybe like a handful of actual jumping workouts with yeah. them right so it's cool how how when you can stabilize the joints the midsection the torso all that um like it just it it it's it's, it's unreal what what he can do what in can terms accomplish. of yeah. yeah it doesn't always have to be flashy no. and that's what happens in the industry right now is there are a handful and i i just want you guys to watch out right if you're on things like instagram and facebook and and social media youtube there's a lot of of content that surfaces that is very exciting to watch right huge high box jumps and really precarious positions excuse me or holding implements and jumping 
to a degree, some of those things can aid in certain elements of jump training. But bottom line is, guys, perfect practice of baseline fundamental skill is going to be your best friend. Mm -hmm. And it's my job to coach athletes that sometimes it's the quote unquote, more boring things that make the biggest difference. And I think any high level athlete would agree is that they're the ones that will decide to take the time necessary to perfect those small, um, subtle nuances mm -hmm. of their training where others won't, mm -hmm. right? They'll, they'll resort to the things that are flashier and cooler and more fun. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I think I've distinguished myself sure. is, you know what, if I can make learning it a little bit more fun, then they'll actually apply and execute. Mm -hmm. Now, I briefly touched on stability in you know, the concept of dynamic stability with jumping versus static, right? And the, I think in the CrossFit world, there's a big um, focus and bias towards static stability, holding positions, right? So, you know, there, I mean, again, there are things that are done maybe in the strongman world that are a little bit more dy dynamic. However, when you talk jumping and its application to CrossFit, we have to look at the different planes of action mm -hmm. that we're working in, right? So something as simple as a burpee box jump. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a box jump, but it's the um, dismount off the box that is different from a traditional box jump dismount, right? We have a lot of shearing forces on the knee that yeah. happen as an athlete is landing, but in their mind thinking first and foremost, I need to kick back into my burpee. So what happens is there's less time spent on the, fo like the focal point of the landing and more on how do I cycle Just this as quick as possible into my next and, burpee. And you, and you always see like the knees out of flex position during it, right? Yeah, exactly. That's more for efficiency, I would imagine. Yeah. Right? So then we don't, you know, if we land on the ball, the foot of the toe with a backward force, right, a, a, a reverse force, then we have a lot of shearing force sure. traveling backwards through the knees. So we have the need to stabilize shearing mm -hmm. both um, in, a linear w in a linear fashion. So when we take those things into consideration, those are very hard to train under static stabilization. Mm -hmm. We need to introduce those forces more frequently. So, right. you know, I do a lot of um, warm-ups and traveling warm-ups, single leg, double leg variations mm -hmm. that require the athlete to stabilize not only the forces, you know, forward and back, but also side to side and rotational as well. Right. So I think just a little bit more focus on that reduces the potential side effects of, of injury. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've watched more than one person injure themselves and their, it was their knees during burpee box jumps. And um, I think we take for granted when the fitness levels increase, you know, as a result, we do get an increase in stability and dynamic stability. But if we don't put a focus into mm -hmm. that, I think we're shortchanging ourselves in the long run. Um, yes, like gymnastics, right? It's a lot of holding positions mm -hmm. and, and weightlifting is a lot of holding positions. So what would you recommend for dynamic stability? Comp so so how would I make my, my, my box jump burpee more efficient in terms of stability for, for dynamic stabil stability? Like what, what, what would I do in, in something as simple as, um, a traveling single leg hop. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And, um, what we can even do here is guys, I'll insert a little clip of this, of this, uh, being performed. And what we're, what we're seeing here is we're seeing, um, an athlete landing a very controlled jump forward and also side to side. And what happens is that the knee, the ankle, the hip, and the trunk have to be able to absorb these forces. And I think if we pattern them enough and in such a controlled fashion that we get a, a big translation over yeah. something like that. So we, we have to take a look at what, what are the effects of the exercise, right? Or the movement. If it's a burpee box jump, then we're concerned primarily about those shearing forces mm -hmm. in the knee. So what do we need to do? We need to pattern shearing force in the knee in a controlled way mm -hmm. and a lot. So I use this as a warm up in most of my workouts mm -hmm. to the point where, you know, it'll take an athlete that is a very high level athlete and I've seen it and you've seen mm -hmm. it in here before mm -hmm. and we go, yeah, this is what the movement is and, the, and I perform it <laughs> and I make it look pretty easy because yeah. I've done thousands and thousands mm -hmm. and thousands of reps and I say, okay, go ahead. And we see a couple hops and, and the position's off and the athlete's wobbling yeah. and there's a lot of this neuromuscular feedback yeah. and shaking, but that's their body learning, right? So I think starting and just working with something as simple as this variation can aid a lot in um, overall performance and workout. Mm -hmm. I think that's a uh, start there more than anything. We'll get a little bit into the concept of potential energy and stored energy in a muscle right. when it comes to jumping. CrossFit has a heavy... Um, heavy focus on flexibility and mobile and, and mobility sure. as a, you know, to be able to hit certain positions for benchmark of a mm -hmm. movement as well as movement efficiency. I think what happens over the course, you know, of CrossFit's kind of career is that because it's become so cool and guys like Kelly Starrett made it so cool that people f focus so much on mobility and flexibility that it could almost be to their detriment. Right. Right, we get almost over mobilization or over like, too much flexibility, and we reduce the body's ability to actually produce force mm -hmm. 
if a associated joint and the tissues are too pliable or too lax, mm -hmm. then we don't have that, or, um, that kind of expression mm -hmm. of power. So it's finding a delicate balance. And I talked to my athletes a little bit about, because I get a lot of questions, right? Like, you know, if I'm more flexible, will I, will I jump higher? And it's like, potentially, if mm -hmm. you're very tight, mm -hmm. right? We take a look at if you are so tight that we are kind of um, tickling that border of injury versus if I'm too <laughs> loose and right. lax, then do I really have the ability to what express areas power? Are, what areas are you looking at uh, for tightness? It's a lot of the posterior chain and jumping, right? So we see a lot of um, jumping athletes that come into the crossword world. Me, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, I jumped at a high level for a long period of time and really only stretched as a means to provide relief to my body if it was really, really mm -hmm. sore. So when I first came into CrossFit, I mean, I had a, I had an uphill climb to do. I couldn't even squat barely two parallel, right? Right. My ankles, my calves, my hamstrings, my low back were so tight from so much jumping. Now, was that a cause from the actual jumping up or even the landing component Maybe of it? Maybe landing a lot too, right? Yeah, jumping for sure requires a lot of violent hip extension, so we get a lot of um, posterior activation right. up the chain. But landing, we then get a lot of high impact and, and detriment to the joints, but then the tissue that surrounds the joints will contract mm -hmm. really heavily to stabilize, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a combination of both. I know it's a combination sure. of both. So, you know, for me, it's like, okay, I need to get that taken care of and move forward and, and become flexible yeah. and mobile enough to be able to perform movement healthily. What about um, injury prevention when it comes to like um, like hip flexor psoas, um, mm -hmm. maybe like, um, even like uh, like ab strains when it comes to like um, violently exploding the hips? Do you find that people that are tight in like the psoas and their hip flexors can, can get a lot of damage in terms of like if they if they're if they too much of a rapid contraction or? Yeah, I think it becomes a, a, a kind of a two part answer, right? One is absolutely if you've never focused on on uh, mobilizing some of the tissue in that mm -hmm. anterior compartment here you know, whether you're a jumping athlete or just somebody that necessarily hasn't, you know, touched that and you genetically have a little bit tighter or shorter mm -hmm. tissue in that area, then of course that, you know, if we all of a sudden take someone that's never jumped and make them jump super hard, we get that, you know, we put them in a very vulnerable position. Yeah. Um, so it's an, it's an assessment need on the coaches then to say, okay, first of all, can an athlete reach full extension? What's the limiter of extension? Is it tissue tightness? Is it a lack of, um, appropriation from the muscles that are creating extension? Mm -hmm. Um, or is it just simply a, a patterning error? Mm -hmm. So it becomes a little bit of, like you said, it's peeling away the layers yeah. and finding out where, where it is we need to start. But injury-wise, you know, it's a individual diagnosis at that point, you know, and it requires an eye that understands not only movement, mm -hmm. but also the application to something like jumping. So that's kind of insert. So this is what I do. That's what I do. <laughs> that's a good question, though. I like that one. Um, so yeah, the next point would have been the benefits of tension for potential energy. It's a balance. Mm -hmm. Some tension is good. And, you know, the athletes watching that maybe have a background in things like football or basketball or volleyball or track that got into CrossFit, obviously know the benefit to things like cleans and, and Olympic lifting movements, box jumping, some of the, uh, extension required in things like muscle ups, right? Mm -hmm. Explosive movements probably came a little bit easier to those athletes, mm -hmm. athletes that came from, uh, the world, uh, world of athletics that sure. doesn't necessarily yeah. have that. Um, need, yeah. obviously it's going to be a bit more difficult. Well, it's like you say with the whole uh, tension thing, like if you pull on a rubber band. Mm -hmm. Depending you, on, yeah, depending yeah. on the rubber band, right? We take two rubber bands um, that are the same, right? Same size, one's thin, one's thicker, right? We pull them the same amount of distance. Obviously, the one that is a little bit thicker is mm -hmm. has the potential to travel further, but it also has the potential to snap faster. Mm -hmm. So we have to find that balance right. between the bands to find out where um, that safe zone lies. And with CrossFit, you're probably going to err a little bit more on the side of laxity than tension. But I think that if we err too far on the side of laxity, then we reduce some of that output right. um, potential as well. Um, the last point I want to make is that nothing is too... Um, trivial to put time into right mm -hmm. something like jumping where someone's like oh well i only ever have to jump on as high as a 30 inch box and i don't even necessarily need hip extension for that that's great you might not need it but that doesn't mean if you have it that you won't improve right mm -hmm. if you're a serious recreational crossfitter or, or fitnesser or if you're a high level um, athlete you go out of your way to make sure that you've crossed all your t's dotted all your i's this is just another t and an i mm -hmm and a J, and a U, and an MPING. <laughs> so do you think that um, if you can express the most amount of power in your jumping with the most amount of efficiency, that will translate into a, just a better crossfitter in terms of performing other movements? 600%.
Not seven? Six hundred percent. I I I'm not crazy. I'm not gonna say seven hundred percent. But yes, one hundred percent. If you pattern the efficiency of your jump, improve the ability of your body to express a jump, translation into a CrossFit workout or overall CrossFit competitor, we have efficiency which reduces fatigue. Mm -hmm. Less energy spent. The same thing is why we work on running and patterning of running. Right. Because then you run and it doesn't cost your body as much energy. Right? It's it's really just that balance. What does it cost us? What do we get out of it? And how do we kind of mitigate that middle ground? Hmm. That's it. I like that. That's it. Uh-huh. I mean, I can go obviously talk for days sure. and days and days and days about this. but That might guys, be a part two. Yeah, we can do a part two. Guys, if you're interested in the world of vertical jump training or um, jump technique, uh, follow me at, at Project Pure Athlete. Um, send us a message through uh, the full depth, obviously. If this was a useful topic for you and you'd like to see other topics maybe similar to this or mm-hmm. different than this covered, let us know as well. We appreciate you guys tuning in as always. Make sure you check us out on iTunes. If you're watching on YouTube, go to iTunes, give us a five-star rating because I said so, and we love you guys. Subscribe, follow us on Instagram. Mm-hmm. We're giving you like a lot of commands right, right now, like do just, this, do just that. Do it. You know just what, do just it. watch if you enjoy it, let us know. If you don't enjoy us, you know what? You'll probably let us know because you're that type of person. Uh, and we and we love it all, all the same. From Tyler Ray, the host of the Full Depth Podcast, handsome Mike, Mike Patella from Sweat Fitness and Performance. We'll catch you in the next one. Peace. Peace.